What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I am really excited about today's episode, and um, I'm here with uh, my good friend, Dean Dutro of Worth Commerce. And before I formally introduce him, Dean, I always like to think about what other episodes people should check out on my podcast based on today's episode. And, and Dean is a master, and his team is a master at e-commerce, anything email marketing, SMS marketing, um, and you know, the, the ones that I looked at, uh, are natural stacks. People should check out the natural stacks interview I did with Roy Krebs. I will say it's probably the best introduction I have over the past 10 years of podcasting. Um, you will know what I mean when you check it out. I don't even want to ruin the surprise. It's, it's, it basically has to do with ESPN also. So check out that, uh, episode of Roy Krebs of natural stacks and how he grew that e-commerce business. Um, and there's many other e-commerce businesses and softwares. And, and just to mention a few, um, we will get into that conversation. Um, and before I introduce today, you know, uh, Dean, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And um, Dean knows intimately about Rise25, but we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And and Dean, you know this, I think by now, because I randomly text you and call you, but the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships. And I've seen no better way to give to my best relationships than having them on my podcast, profiling them, profiling their company, the companies I admire and the people I admire like Dean. So if you've thought about doing a podcast, do it. I think every business should have a podcast. Um, go to rise25.com, check out more, learn more. And uh, we're happy to help. We've been doing it for a long time now. And uh, Dean Dutro and Ryan O'Connor, his, his co-founder, they run Worthy Commerce and they're a Portland-based email agency. Um, and basically, you know, they're email marketing experts that have helped grow over 700 online stores, including their own two stores, by the way. And ultimately, they help these companies turn their email list into an ATM. Um, and it basically, they increase sales by sometimes 30% or more with an asset that you own. So unlike, as we know, Dean, you can run Facebook ads. You can, um, you know, if, if people have Amazon customers, if, you know, those, you don't own any of that data, right? But when you have an email, you can deploy that over and over and over again to generate revenue. So they've had clients, uh, I think there was a cake company, they went from like 100,000 a month to 300,000 a month and maybe yeah. beyond that by now. And 50% of that came from email. and you know, so if you are, and this is what I, I tell Dean, because I recommend people all the time to check out what you're doing. If you're an e-commerce company and you're doing over $500,000 in sales, okay, or more, um, they can help. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there with not just email, but, but text message marketing, which they also do. So um, we're going to dig in to some, if you are an e-commerce or you know someone, you send them this interview because we're going to go talk about cart abandonment series, new subscriber series, new customer series. It's not just about sending an email, right? Dean, be like, oh, we just send emails. Like, no, there's actually re-engagement series. There's all these different things to also A-B test and there's list segmentation. I can go on and on, but uh, Dean, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jeremy. And, uh, you know, you run our podcast on, on the back end and have helped us grow that in, in our audience and gain some great clients. So, Shout out to Rise and, and what you guys do. It's it's been awesome to to work with you this last year. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. And you know, I wanted to dig in first on people love software, people love tools. So I wanted to start off with some of the software and tools in the e-commerce space that that you tout that you recommend. Yeah. So you know, we we built our business off the back of a software called Clavio, and they essentially you know, are an email marketing uh, software or provider. And, you know, what they've done over the last few years is, is pretty astounding in terms of when we started using them for our clients, they had like 400 paid customers. Now they have over, I think, 60,000. And so their, their growth has been insane. It's because it's so easy to use. 
and it gives you information that's useful and actionable, right? And a lot of the other ESPs, they give you all this information or the, the UX sucks or it doesn't have all the segmentation you can do. Uh, so Clavio is this robust program that is also easy to use, which makes it very unique uh, from an ESP perspective. Uh, in fact, none of our clients use any other, other platforms. Um, we stopped using MailChimp years ago. Uh, Bronto just shut down. Really? Right? I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're done. And it makes sense because their whole system was, I mean, it was literally a dinosaur. They're named after a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, so we use Clavio. They're, they're extinct now. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, they're still growing and evolving. They have all these new features. We don't leverage their SMS just yet. They're still catching up to some other companies. We use a company called Postscript uh, and often also Attentive for SMS, depending on the size of the client. And they just have great customer service. One of the things I look for in software partners is do they have good customer service? Can you get on the phone with someone, right? And that's really hard to do with most software companies. Clavio, uh, Postscript, uh, Just Duno is an email capture and conversion pop-up software we use. Uh, you know, they even have a dedicated Slack channel that they connect with us on, right? So you got you to get with the software that have great customer service because it means they're, they're committed to you and committed to improving their product over time. Mm. Uh, so, so those three are like the ones I highly, highly recommend. Those are the big ones. Yeah. I mean, you say like Clavio is easy to use. It's because you guys are masters at Clavio also. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of times people will get super confused with, with those things. Um, yeah. But I want to dig into, we're going to talk about SMS. We're going to talk about email. And I would love to have you talk about just some of the, the series. I mentioned there's all these different types of emails that people should consider sending. Um, because I think some people have a notion of, well, you just go out and you send a broadcast email whenever you want. And, and you would, and most people who use email correctly would argue differently. So what are some of the things people should be setting up inside of their email to, to support and nurture their, their customers? Yeah, and that's a great question. Uh, I will say if you're not sending any emails at all, then you should just start sending campaigns you know, tomorrow uh, to, to, some, to some folks. But uh, you know, ultimately, email is about sending the right message to the right person at the right time. And luckily in e-commerce, all that stuff is very trackable. Right, so we base our conversations, our flows, drips, automations. Everyone has different jargon for it. I like to call them flows, based off the customer lifecycle in e-commerce, which is very, very simple. You have prospects, new customers, repeat customers, what we call like your VIP customers, uh, lapsed prospects, and lapsed customers. And for each of those stages, you can create you know, an email flow of three to 10 emails, depending on how advanced you want to get, that targets each of those. So it comes out to be eight, eight flows on average. I, I call them the foundational flows. Uh, there should be a book. If, I'm waiting for your yeah, next book, The Foundational yeah. Flow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just get some interviews and transcribe <laughs> it. I've said it so many times. Uh, but the foundational flows, what they do is they, they accomplish several things, right? So email is, is a combination of Brand indoctrination, right? So letting people understand and, and get to know your brand. Uh, customer support and customer service, right? So how can you use email as a customer support tool uh, that provides a really great experience as well? Uh, and then also letting them know about new pro products, sales, things like that. So you have to have a mix of these things in there. Um, the sort of top four flows I would say people should get started with is get a welcome flow for prospects, right? So put people through a series of emails that informs them about your brand because I guarantee they're price shopping and they're looking for indicators such as trust, social proof. Uh, do you have good deals? Uh, do you have high quality products? So whatever your sort of leverage is, use that. Uh, the next is the new customer email. A lot of people don't set this up at all, but there's something that happens when people purchase things called buyer's remorse. And what that means is you immediately regret a purchase you just made, right? Like how many times you've been at the supermarket or purchased a car and you're like, oh shit, was this the right decision? I don't know if I should have done that. Like, was this impulsive? So you want to pepper people with affirmations that, hey, you made the right choice here. 
Like, and we're here for you if you need anything, if anything goes wrong. Um, and then of course, uh, everyone probably knows about this by now, cart abandonment emails, right? So these are people that are intending to buy, but something happens. I don't think I really need to talk about that. Everyone kind of knows what that is by now. Um, and then a really powerful- Well, I think, I think you know, Dean, people, I mean, this, I was shocked by the metrics mm, of yeah. cart abandonment. Like, I don't know, it's, is it like 90% or 95% or something of, they, they add it to their cart and then don't buy it. Yeah. Is yeah, that it's right? Like, I, mean, uh, I think it's like 74% of people that add to mm -hmm. cart don't purchase. Okay. Now there's two, there's two different things to think about. One is add to cart, right? Which is you click the add to cart button and then it ends up in your, your cart thing icon. Uh, the other is added to checkout, right? So those are two separate things that often get confused. Your add to cart versus add to checkout or, or checkout started metrics, um, the conversions are going to be different because that checkout started is where they're putting in their credit card information, where they're putting in their address. It's a signal to, to buy, right? So you, you actually would have two flows. I'm probably getting way too technical here. <laughs> no, right? I think, no, keep going. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, I mean, anyone, you know, people are listening to this, you know, they probably are, you know, when you get too technical, it's not too technical for someone who actually has an e-commerce store and is interested in yeah, these yeah. things. You know, we will talk about general business stuff on here so you could stick with it. But I, I believe, you know, Dean, honestly, for any company, this is this applies to any company. This is not just yeah. e-commerce, right? This is you should have a welcome flow. You should have a new customer flow. You should have a, you know, if it's set up with the right email, like a cart abandonment, like someone, if it's a course, if it's a service, if it's something. Oh, yeah. So anyways, keep going with it. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and that's that's exactly the point is the, the customer life cycle doesn't really change from industry to industry. Right, but the tools change and how you can apply it changes. Right, but if you have that foundational knowledge of this is what people go through, this is the average purchase time, this is the average repeat purchase, you can kind of make educated guesses because I, I think marketing is is part art, part science, and it's always unique to your brand. Right, but there's some foundations that that run rampant no matter what. Um, <clears throat> so, anyways, yeah, seventy four percent of people abandoning checkout, and so you just want to follow up with those people, you know. And again, you don't have to give a major discount, but educate them, you know, provide good customer service. And then I like to use uh, what I call a discount escalation ladder, which is we don't provide discounts until they're like, it, it's like a last ditch effort, right? Where it's like, we've sent them all the good information. We've done all the customer, all the purchase objections. Uh, we've gone through the process. They've been to our site and like, for whatever reason, they're not buying, let's give them a discount. Um, that's the approach that I like to take. I like that. The patented, your margin. <laughs> the patented discount escalation ladder. You have, you have yeah. a lot of interesting stuff in you. Well, it's interesting because we've experienced this as a, as a customer I have, like where I like it, I'm going to get it. I go in. It's amazing. I mean, talk about low hanging fruit. If you don't have a cart abandonment series, right? Yeah. It's someone who went, entered everything in there, went to checkout and didn't check out. So maybe... <laughs> Their kid like fell down the steps or something. I don't know. I mean, or whatever happened, and they just had to go away. But talking about the discount escalation ladder, you know, I've been, I've, you know, gone to add something to my car. I'm like, oh, I, I got busy and I went off. I'm going to go back and buy it. And yeah. some of those companies sent me like, oh, 20% off. I'm like, oh, good thing I waited. They sent me a 20%. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to go back and buy anyways. But if they sent me, like you said, a escalated, you know, different emails and just there was education information that would have just reminded me to do it. And I would have bought it anyways, as opposed to give them listen, I appreciate the 20% discount, but then you also wonder, well, what, a, what, you know, it, there's a trust factor there of someone just offering a discount right off the bat. I was like, well, should I have just waited? Should I wait all the time now for buying companies from this product? Cause they're gonna give me, you know, so there's, that could have a negative effect as well. Yeah. Right. And what's, what's, uh, that can have a long term negative effect. But what's really interesting is that over time, you can create segments in your email system of discount purchasers and non discount purchasers. So then you can start to target different people with different sales or product launches with uh, either no discount or discounts based off their past purchase behavior. Uh, so over time, you're, you know, it should start to level out because there's going to be a large percentage of people that never purchase with a discount. Um, 
we, we know that because if, if you offer 10% off, you know, for adding your email in, there's only like eight to 10% of people will sign up for that, which means anyone else that purchases isn't using a coupon code. Uh, some of the best, you know, over time, I've, I've probably interviewed some of the best um, direct response copywriters, direct response marketers in the world. Okay. And they always talk, Dean, about list segmentation. How important it is for list segmentation? Can you, can you walk me through a little bit about what you're looking at? Because you're looking at the back end and you're looking at all these metrics inside of Clavio. What do you, what do you see as how people should segment their lists? That's like, that is a very tough question. Um, well, you mean, you, you hit on it for, a little bit with, you know, discounts. That's one way, you know, you could segment and look at sending really customized messages or emails. So one yeah. would be, you know, people who bought with a discount. What are the other kind of metrics or things you're looking at on the back end? Yeah. So, so one of the key things you want to think about initially, right? Because you could segment a million different ways. Right. So I really like to think about it from a 2080 perspective and then a growth perspective of your brand and email list size. So what that means is when you're first starting, it is all about engagement. Right. So who is engaging with your brand, who sometimes engages with your brand, who like rarely engages with your brand and who is never engaged with your brand. I actually call them groups A through E. So group A is are, are people who will open almost every email. Group B is like they open, you know, every two weeks. Group C is once a month. Group D is once a quarter. And group B, you take them off your list. And there's actually a technical a definition of engagement from Google, which is about 120 days. So if someone is on your email list and hasn't engaged with your brand, whether it's opened an email, clicked an email, been to your site, uh, or purchased anything in 120 days, they're automatically considered unengaged in Gmail's eyes, right? A lot of people don't know this, but if you go to your trash, and you search and you search in your trash bin, you'll see emails you never deleted in your trash, not your spam, but your trash. Because Google is basically saying, hey, you haven't opened an email from these guys in a long time. It's not technically spam because you haven't marked it as spam, but you haven't unsubscribed. Let's just put it in their trash, right? And uh, a lot of people don't know that. So you gotta really be aware of that and, and keep that 120 day you know, segmentation in mind. So. Uh, depending on your, there's a there's hundred different ways you could do it, but a good rule of thumb is like, if you don't know, start with anyone who's opened an email in the last 30 days. See if your open rates are high, which would be 30% or more, uh, 35%. Uh, then once you send it to those people, expand it to like 90 days and see what does engagement look like if you send to people who haven't opened in 90 days. If it's, is it still you know, 20, 25%? And you go all the way until you're about 15% open rates for campaigns. And then you start scaling back because that's, that's where it gets a little sketchy in terms of uh, your overall deliverability. So you look so at much information, but <laughs> no, I love it because you look at engagement first and filter first by engagement. And then there's other ways you can obviously filter and segment things. Yeah. Cause it's about uh, deliverability first, right? It's about building trust with Gmail, Yahoo, Outlook, whatever email systems people use, because without that trust built, then your emails aren't gonna succeed. Um, the foundational flows also really help build trust. In fact, I say the foundational flows tee you up for success later because it builds trust, trust open rates, click-through rates with your subscribers, with Gmail, because it's very targeted. Uh, and then when you send a campaign you know, for Black Friday, your open rates should be higher and you should you know, make a bunch of money. You know, Dean, I love what you said about 80-20. I, I think about 80-20 on an hourly basis, okay, with everything. And um, people, and so I want to hit in, we, we talked about the eight foundational flows. What stuck out to me, like a bat signal, was the VIP, right? Because oh, yeah. if you think about 80-20, like, 20%, you know, people, first of all, I had uh, Perry Marshall on my podcast. You should check it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He wrote the 80, 20 sales and marketing book. It's a fantastic nice. book. He was personally mentored and uh, was, uh, has a relationship with Richard Koch, who wrote a lot of the 80 and 20 principle uh, books. Uh, if you check them out on audible, but um, you know, 20, you know, 80% of our sales come from 20% of our clients. I mean, it's just, you know, the 80, 20 principle, right? So the VIP, it could be even be 
5% or 20, 95% of revenue comes from 5% of our clients potentially, right? So I'm curious on the VIP flow, what are some things that you find how you communicate with those VIPs or what do you do with those VIPs? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is one of our, I think, unique flows that we build out for our clients that we've mm -hmm. tested over time. So one is you want to start moving into text-based emails, right? And video-based emails. So typically what we'll, we'll, we'll ask our, our clients, hey, can you create just a selfie video of you thanking your best customers for being loyal, joining you on the journey, and uh, show some gratitude towards them? And then hint that because they're a VIP, they're going to get special access to new product launches first, uh, you know, emails from you, et cetera. Um, so I like to start with a simple letter from the founder and then a video from the founder, right? And those perform so well. They're usually, uh, I don't know, a paragraph, maybe two, no links, no sales, no language, and they crush it. <laughs> like they absolutely crush it. Um, you could go a step further if, you, if you're willing to and identify your VIP customers and uh, we've got a couple of clients who have started doing this. I actually heard this from a, someone I have on a podcast. But if someone spends $1,000 with you or $2,000 with you, depending you know, on your price, whatever your price point is, uh, these people, they'll call those customers. A hundred percent. It's like right? the lost art of talking to someone over the phone. Yeah. 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 And like, that blows people away. You know? And you never know who you're going to call or send a video message like that too, who may happen to have a large Instagram following or a large social media following, and then they post about it, right? So there's some, like, I call it like backyard marketing at scale, which is like when you're over barbecuing with someone, and like you're wearing like a cool shirt, you know, people are like, oh, like, tell me about that shirt. And you'd be like, oh, I got this from these guys. What if you were like, oh, I got this from these guys. And then they called me and thanked me, you know? Uh, but then imagine that, you know, with 5,000 Instagram followers or 10,000 or whatever. So you just, just never know. You just never know. Yeah. I mean, they are your premium, you know, they're your VIP customers, right? I mean, they love yep. you the most. Obviously they're showing it with their wallet by buying stuff from you. So, yep. so if, if people don't get anything else out of this entire interview, like right now, you should probably, after this interview is done, listen to the rest of it, but look and see who are your best and just give them a call like say thank you and and chat with them yeah. you know it's like so simple and it probably will take 10 minutes but it will have a huge impact on them and your business right um yeah so thank you for sharing that the i love that the vip um the, the next thing i wanted to ask about dean is i wanted to kind of talk about sms and email a little yeah. bit um and um, SMS, like, I don't know, there's not a, a text that comes through that I don't see or check. Yeah. And I would think even you're, I would argue like you seem busier than me. So I would guess that you also look at all your text messages. So the deliverability and the viewing rate is huge. Talk about, um, there was a golf company. Talk about the golf company and, and what they do with SMS. Yeah. So SMS is like, there's like a gold rush for, there's a gold rush for phone numbers, right? Uh, because people are starting to see the value of it, right? And if you get into it early enough, I think you're going to be positioned long-term for long-term success with your customers before your competitors get in, because they're not going to want to have, you know, three golf companies texting them. They're going to want to have one, right? And they're going to want to be loyal to them, right? So you got to get in early. But ultimately, like for these guys, we, we started text messaging for them about three, maybe four months ago, zero list. So it was, it's, an, it's an investment, right? And it's just like growing your email list in a lot of ways. But it's a little bit different than email. Uh, I, I think it's an auxiliary benefit that has a potential to be a main source of, of input from people. Uh, for, so for a couple of reasons, so let, let me take a step back. For these guys, you know, over three months, we collected three or 4,000 emails. And, or phone numbers. And from that, you know, we're making 30 or $40,000 a month from text messages. Wow. Uh, that being said, we're also sending emails at the same time we're sending text messages. So 
you know, there's, there's data out there that shows yeah. that if people see there's multiple touch points, there, multiple touch points, right? Yeah. So it's not a hundred percent attributable. Yeah. It could come from the email or a Facebook ad or yeah. SMS, but the more touch points you have, right. The more likely people are going to convert, which then increases your, your overall margins and increases, creates uh, revenue velocity. Um, the hardest part about SMS is the character limit is very like tight, right? It's gotta be very direct and to the point. And a lot of people are unsure if they should prioritize collecting emails or collecting phone numbers. That's a, that's a big sort of hump that people have to get over. Like Can you, you do to... both at the same time with an email opt-in capture or? Yeah, yeah. So, so what I like to do is, is present the email opt-in first. A, a company that does this really well is Hydroflask. If you go to their website, you'll see how they, how they build it. I think they use uh, Attentive uh, for software, but how they do it is, and I think it's genius, is they capture the email first, just like a typical pop-up. And then the next page says, oh, we also have this SMS program if you want news faster or better deals. Enter your you know, phone number to join the SMS list. Then you capture both. But if they don't enter it, you still have their email, right? So now you're, you're, you're able to potentially collect two sources of data from them and then you email them the relevant information. Now, in regards to SMS, you know, right now you're gonna have 99% open rates, right? In the future, I already know this because I've seen screenshots. I think we might've talked about it. Was that you and I talking about it in the mastermind? Um, Apple is starting to create like promotions tabs in their text, in their, in their iMessages. Hmm. It's in beta, but they haven't launched it. Uh, so in the future, it's gonna be like Gmail where it's like your inbox and then your promotions, which makes a lot of sense. And why wouldn't they do that? Uh, and then I'm sure there'll be data on like the average number of text message subscriptions people subscribe to. My guess it'll be like six, right? So can you get on phone numbers early? Cause I imagine, you know, if you just look at your text message screen, you only see maybe seven or eight messages. You don't want them all to be from companies. Right. So I think it'll just be a, like a matter of how things look on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, what are so, some of the incentives, Dean, that you've seen work with SMS? Because like you said, that one company takes you another page. I mean, I used it even with the chiropractic office I owned. If someone's sitting there, the staff would be like, if let's say they came in for a massage, be like, listen, um, if you want a discount off today's massage of $10, you could just subscribe right now. And yeah. you'll get, you could unsubscribe at any time, but you will get the, the best deals. You'll get the best, you know, the, the information first, et cetera. And because that, that is a valuable touch point, you know, yeah. what are some incentives you've seen that work with companies? Yeah, you know, honestly, it doesn't have to be too different than email. I used mm -hmm. to be in the camp that if someone's going to give you their phone number, then you should offer better discounts. I don't believe that anymore because I think it's a preference choice, right? What you're really offering is a preference. So your email discount should be the same as your SMS discounts, in my opinion. Um, a lot of people started going, oh, like we got to collect all these phone numbers, so offer them better discounts. I thought that too, but it's really a matter of preference, right? And what I've seen is demographically, there are certain demogra demographics that actually prefer text message. Uh, you'd be surprised to hear it's, it's often baby boomers. So companies I am that, surprised. that target uh, baby boomers, like this golf company, uh, for example, uh, they like text, texting better than email, right? And the other thing is, is the key to a successful SMS program is if you make it a two-way communication channel. So you need a customer ser service rep, or you can do it yourself uh, if you just want to get started, where people can respond to you via text, just like they're texting a person. The people that do that are going to far outperform and get massive ROI, you know, by hiring a person to field these Phone numbers because people don't really respond to promotional emails, you know. Like, no, when's the last time you get reply to a Black Friday email? Never, never. Right? No. But if you encourage that on SMS, I think uh, that's going to be an extra piece and layer of customer service that that will help your brand grow. So, is there? And this may this is kind of a separate topic a little bit, but let's you know when you go into a website and oftentimes people have a chat feature. Right. A thing pops up, go, hey, how can I help you? Um, does the recommendation of the software you use and help people set up these flows for, 
use that type of technology? So like if someone enters in, or is it more like a lead capture where people are capturing that, that um, text message? Because when I picture two-way conversation, I picture that, you know, that box shows up, whatever, there's tons of intercom, there's a bunch of ones and you're typing in there. Does this also replace that from the web page, or is this just totally a separate piece from just an SMS perspective? I, I imagine in the future it'll be a lot more integrated. Yeah. Right. As but you can like you can collect phone numbers and emails from those chatbots and send it to your software. Uh, but you have to still view it in another in another software. So I imagine in the future it'll be integrated. Um, I I hate chatbots because often they're bots. Yeah. And and I have to I have to wait on the website. I don't want to wait on someone's website, you know, like I want to send them a message and then hear back when, without waiting. So that's why I think, uh, SMS will. Asynchronous. Uh, still, yeah, exactly. Um, but I, you know, I think those chat bots are, are still good. Um, but SMS, you know, because you don't have to wait on site is, is going to be the, the, the best yeah. route. But from what you recommend is you're sending like broadcast messages, uh, or text messages, but it allows a two-way communication. So they can, yeah. I mean, not all of them will be like deals or sales. It may be just whatever, some kind of information and encouraging yeah. someone to respond back. Yeah. And just like an email, your SMS messages, you can create flows. So you still target the same people with a slightly different, smaller message. And, uh, you know, it's very powerful. Uh, the receipt, the receipt, uh, people love the, uh, the receipts on their phone right? Just getting a text message saying, confirmed your order, your order has shipped. Those perform really well. Um, mm. but sometimes you can add in a little discount here and there in those, but uh, people love, people respond really well to just seeing it on their phone. It's that peace of mind again, that buyer's remorse that you're tackling. I feel like Dean, this is, uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong. This is also low hanging fruit. What, what percentage of companies that come to you with email do not have text message at all? Almost all of them. All of um, them. Wow. Yeah. I'd say like 90% aren't using text. And if they are, it's very basic. Um, it's shocking, lot, right? It's very shocking. Yeah. I think it's because it's a hesitancy. It's that, are we intruding on people? Is there privacy issues? You know, you want to be, be US based. Um, and the United States is an opt in culture or excuse me, opt out culture. But around phone numbers, it's a lot more restrictive. So they want to make sure you are opting in. Uh, so, you know, there's specific language you have to use on your website that to some people, they may think it'll hurt conversions or it'll look bad or whatever, but it's, it's, it's not a big deal, it's, especially as it goes to market. Is there a language that you found make people feel warm and fuzzy to give an email or sorry, a text like, um, you know, it always, it always I always think of not using the word spam. Like when you use the words like, we will not spam you. Well, that means we are probably going to spam them. I mean, that's what they're thinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> Why using the word spam at all? So is there any language you found that is good to, to that is not total legalese speak, but is good from uh, make them feel good, but sounds like a normal human being? I, I just think using hu humor from your brand works really well. You know, like you don't, like you're not going to trick people. Into, into giving you their phone number, you know, like you're not. And just being straight up like, hey, like you can enter your email and get a discount and enter your phone number and get a discount, right? And you can make it look nice, make it humorous. And then with, the, there's specific language you have to use, right? So you just use that and, and people feel safe. Um, some copy works better than others. Some design works better than others. Um, I really like two-step opt-ins, which means you ask someone if they want a discount and they say yes or no. It's called a micro-conversion. Uh, and by doing a micro-conversion, you're more likely to get a, a second yes and a third yes, right? It's uh, some psychology term yeah. of, of escalating yeses or something. I can't remember. Yeah, term, but... Robert Cialdini talks about it yeah. in his book, Influence. And I forgot the exact example, but they asked people to put like a small sign and then, mm. or sign a petition. Then they went back and anyone who signed the petition, they want like put a, like a, a monstrosity of a, I'm, I'm pro, you know, I'm butchering it. You could just check out influence of Robert Chiodini, but it goes to your point. You get this small commitment and then the next commitment. Oh yeah. We're going to put a big billboard on your lawn. Is that okay? Oh yeah, sure. I already signed it. You know? So yeah. 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 And, and we may be tested it. So we find that two-step usually converts higher. 
uh, but not always, right? There's certain brands where it hasn't worked as much. I don't know why, but it could, you know, it's always worth an A-B test. I want to talk about email. So um, that, that's fascinating. Thanks for going down that, that path for the SMS piece. And let's <laughs> talk about email. Um, and we were talking a little before we hit record about how it has saved companies in some respects. Um, and I didn't want you to tell me anything else because I want to hear it on here. But what, what did you mean by that? Yeah, so there's this concept I've been, I've been playing around with. Someone's probably already come up with it, but it's the idea that if you're an influence, like if your brand has thousands of followers on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube uh, or other social media platforms, TikTok, like you're basically a rental business, right? You don't own any of that at, at all. If you think you do, you're wrong. And even your SEO, you don't own because Google can change your algorithm at any moment. And then your visitor count goes down to nothing. I've seen that happen over the last six years, dozens of times where someone gets banned from Facebook advertising for zero reason, right? Especially uh, during the pandemic, like they cracked down hard on companies during the pandemic. And those companies, like if they didn't have an email system, they wouldn't be making any money at all. So what happens with email, there's two major benefits. One is that, and, and I would say this about any owned marketing, but specifically email, uh, because you can send out promotions, is that it's a profit driver. So the cost to send 10,000 emails versus 100,000 emails is like a thousand dollar difference. Whereas the cost to drive 10,000 visitors versus 100,000 visitors is like a hundred grand difference, you know, I'm sure I'm butchering those numbers, but uh, so what happens is over time, as you collect more emails and you engage with people, uh, your cost to, to, to acquire massively decreases, which means your profit margins raise, which means you can invest in your front end channels again. Uh, the other piece is if your Facebook account gets uh, banned or your Instagram account gets banned or Google changes SEO, you have a list of 50,000 people, 100,000 people, hopefully that you can sit, still send emails to and make money, right? Um, and you'll probably be like, holy shit, I'm, at, I'm making a higher profit right now because uh, I'm not spending any money on ads. Uh, so it's this interesting flip where sales go down, profit goes up uh, for a momentary you know, time, but it gives you enough space to figure out what to do next. Yeah, I mean, also we've seen with a lot of these social media channels, the organic reach all, you know, even if you have 100,000 people or whatever, 10,000, the organic reach of those is just greatly diminished. It's a, you know, it's a payer, it's a pay to play at yeah. that point. It's like, oh, we can charge people for this. So getting them off of those platforms and getting them into an email or text or whatever that you can deploy whenever you want is important. Um, talk about some of the things you've, you've been looking at. You know, I've been in the room with some of the top um, Amazon sellers around um, that have, they're all multi-channel, right? They have their e-commerce store, they have Amazon, they have, you know, uh, eBay, whatever it is. Talk about some of the, the stuff you're doing as far as um, Amazon sellers go. Yeah. So, you know, I used to be in the camp of like, you should own your marketing. You should get off of Amazon. You should get off of Walmart or, or whatever and, and screw them like they're taking your margin. Uh, but as I got more familiar with the power of Amazon and different sellers who are doing Amazon well, uh, who often don't have a very big like Shopify presence, for example, or own marketing presence, uh, you, you're starting to see a lot of people go omni-channel, right? And so we're, right now we're testing and, and I'll probably follow up after this podcast in a few months with some results to put in. But ultimately I have this theory and hypothesis that we want to use your own marketing to create sales velocity for these other channels. Uh, so specifically Amazon, because Amazon is so huge. So if you think about it, you know, the average Shopify website has a three to 5% conversion rate, which means 97 to 95% of people that come to your site are not purchasing, but I guarantee they're looking elsewhere, either at competitors or at Amazon for different pricing. They want two day shipping, right? So there's this thing called the spillover effect and either they either find you through ads. Sometimes they find you through Amazon. So if you, if you look at a product on Amazon, oftentimes people will search the product in Google to see if there's better discounts. And that's called or the Or to see effect. if they're legit. I mean, yeah, they may go legit. Amazon Gold, they go to the website 
and then they go back to Amazon to buy. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's just kind of back and forth and there's no way to accurately track it, but we know it happens, right? And you can, you could ask people post-purchase, you know, where they found you and maybe you find a ton of people find you from Amazon. But what we're betting on is that we want to use Amazon's algorithm to our benefit, right? So if, if I have, you know, 10,000 email addresses, let's say I send 50% of them directly. Let's say it's, uh, uh, what's coming up? Mother's Day is coming up. Let's say I have a Mother's Day product I want to promote. I have it on Amazon. I have it on my store. Let's say I send 50% to Amazon and 50% to my store, right? And these are emails you've already collected. We know that the average Amazon conversion rate is 17%. That far outstrips any Shopify site by a wide margin. So if we send those 5,000 people, you can directly correlate you know, a boost in traffic of 5,000 to increase sales on Amazon. Right. And then you can compare to see if the amount of sales catches up to the margin you make on your site. So that's that's one thing that's a benefit. And slow me down if I'm going too fast because this stuff excites me. Yeah, um, go ahead. The other piece is the long tail effect of sales velocity by using your owned marketing to send traffic directly to Amazon to increase your organic reach on Amazon, right? Thus lowering your ad spend, thus increasing profit, thus creating a cycle of growth, right? Uh, so I just went on a huge tangent, but the, basically the, the idea is this, Amazon rewards you for sending outside traffic to their site. So if you send direct traffic there and people purchase, you're gonna show up in the rankings higher, just like you would in like Google, first page of Google, right? Uh, that should lead to more spillover effect, which means more people are gonna go from Amazon to your site, which means you'll collect more emails, which then means you have more emails to send to Amazon, which then just creates this growth cycle for you. Um, that's the theory. I think it'll take three to six months to really know if it's true or not, but, uh, there's some indicators that, that are looking pretty good. Yeah. I mean, Dean, that makes perfect sense because if you think about Amazon, right. Um, when you send traffic to Amazon and you know, there's a couple things that obviously signal increased rankings in Amazon, right. Which is reviews yep. and sales. Right. And so if I'm Amazon, I want to reward people for sending people to Amazon. Or even if you if you didn't, but you get like a thousand more sales on that product, it's going to signal to Amazon. This is an important product. And like what you're saying is you're, you may lose some margin if yeah. you send them, obviously, to Amazon or your website. But you could see in a tenfold increase in sales potentially if you boost up and you're in the top page for certain keyword terms or that product, which would far outweigh the margin that you would gain by sending them to your website. Yeah. Right. So if you, you can think about it as an investment, right. In, uh, in sales velocity. Uh, and then a lot of those people end up buying on your side anyways, you know, especially if it's a, it's a, a product that people like. I've had, I've talked to some sellers, Dean that said they put on their website, um, and I don't know, again, like it's something that you have to track, but they put on their website, um, this is the same low price that you'll get on Amazon mm, um, nice. on their website. And they thought they were kind of worried about it because they're saying, oh, we're also on Amazon. That may signal for them to go over to Amazon to buy. But what some people go to Amazon to find the lowest price. And so they found by telling them this particular product, this particular person found by telling them on the site, this is as low as price as you'll get on Amazon. They just bought on the site and they didn't even go over to Amazon. Um, so they, it said, they said it increased their conversion rate tremendously by putting that on their website, um, which I find it could be counterintuitive. Like you're telling them you're on Amazon, they may go over and buy there, but uh, you know, I, think, I think there's a, a big sense. People know how big Amazon is. And unless they're in a hurry to get something, some sort of like, you, you know, product you need, like toilet paper or some sort of grocery or some sort of like, you know, product that you just need quick, they're willing to wait and support these other companies. I think there's a big, at least I feel that. I'm not sure if you feel that way, but um, I kind of get that sense from people I talk to, even like my grandparents are like, I don't really want to buy from Amazon. Like, I want to go to the local shop and buy. Like grandpa, they're online. Like <laughs> you can still buy from them on their website. <laughs> no, totally. And you, you do, 
people are conscious that probably either consciously or subconsciously that Amazon takes a chunk and they just want to interact with that business owner to business owner and not like yeah. the big conglomerate. Um, Dean, first of all, thank you. You know, I, I have, um, I know we have a couple minutes left. I have uh, a last question or two for you. Um, but before I go into that, I want to point people towards to check out more, check out worth ecommerce.com. Um, check out what they have going on, check out their podcast, um, the relationship commerce podcast. And it's on their, you know, you can go to the podcast page on worth ecommerce and check it out. They have some amazing episodes with, um, people like Amir from habit nest, Rob from Dura apparel and, and many, many more talking about their journey in e-commerce and how they've grown. So I encourage you to check out those episodes. Um, Dean, last question or two I want to talk about. You, you are really one of the sharpest minds on just business stuff and growing a company. And um, I learn a lot from you about how you lead the company and how you um, attract talent. And so I love to talk about a little bit about just the company and the culture and you actually used to um, help recruit. I mean, that's what you did. And so I love to have you talk about, you know, attracting and recruiting talent for a second. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I've got some extra time if we do go over, okay. um, if, if you got time, because I think this is pretty important. Um, and uh, thank you for the kind words. I always feel like I'm learning as I go. And uh, anything I've learned is, is through being in the fire, but also reading a lot of books uh, and, and mentorship. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, recruiting. My, my first job out of college, I was a, I was a recruiter. Uh, and I didn't know what that meant at the time. It was for this large billion dollar company called Aerotech. And the owner owns like, the, like some football team like the Baltimore Ravens or something. And, uh, but they, they taught me two things. They taught me how to recruit and they taught me about culture building. And there's a reason why they're a multi-billion dollar company, right? It was because of those two things in, in sales, honestly. Uh, they're, they're basically a sales engine and provide an amazing service for people, for companies. But, you know, they, they teach you how to recruit. They teach you how to talk to people, to ask specific questions, to see, you know, what are their goals, where they want to go? And do you have something that fits with that? And when I recruit, you know, when, when I first started in business, it was, it's kind of a fail, right? Like the first business I started was the whole idea was I want to travel. I want to work remote. Uh, I was with my co-founder, Ryan. We were like, we're going to live on beaches. We're going to drink beer. We're going to be in the sun and we're going to make a bunch of money. And like we did, we did all of that except make money. <laughs> And uh, so it's still a win. <laughs> it's still, it's still a win. You know, but we, we ended up broke in debt and I ended up living at my grandparents' house for like a year. And so did he after that venture. We were, you know, we were in like Thailand and Bali and Australia. And it was, it was a wild time, a really fun time, um, but also very stressful because I didn't have any money. And uh, which isn't new. I've, I've been to that place before. But what I realized is that we didn't have a vision or a mission that would attract people or values that would attract people that would, would want to work with us, it attracted the wrong kind of people, right? The sort of short-term friends and relationships, and then you, then you move somewhere, you don't hear from them again. Uh, so I kind of went back to the drawing board and started talking about, okay, what are my values? What's important to me? What did I miss while traveling? And to me, that was community. And I come from a small business background. So my, my parents and my grandparents, uh, specifically my mom, and my grandma, both had their own businesses hmm. and, uh, what their ups were they? and downs with that. What were the businesses? Uh, uh, my mom had an apparel company, mm -hmm. um, called lipstick whiskey. It's like, uh, Sounds great. She, she would like go to rodeos and stuff and sell like, like whiskey shirts and stuff. Uh, it's like got, got whiskey or got rodeo. Uh, and, uh, and then my grandma was a kitchen designer and had a kitchen and design business since she was in her thirties in Santa Barbara, Alaska, and then in Bend. And uh, so small business was important to me, but also saw the struggle with it, right? Like times are good, times are good, times are bad, it can be rough. And I always thought it'd be cool to help other business owners grow. And I found email that became a way to do it. And so the mission became, how could I help 
you know, small businesses generate more than a million bucks in revenue using, you know, email or SMS. That vision has changed a little, but that's still the core. I still like working with these businesses because a lot of people think entrepreneurs make a boatload of money. It's not usually true for a long time. You know, like you don't make good, unless you're a unicorn, you don't really make that good of money until you're five, six, seven, 10 yeah. years in. Um, and so how could I accelerate that process for people? And that resonated with, with people I wanted to hire. A lot of freelancers. I worked at a, a co-working space, which had a lot of creative freelancers in Portland and recruited my first like almost 10 employees from there and recruited them by just talking about what I wanted to do, like what the values were and what the mission was. And people latched onto that. And if you align your values with theirs and really dig into like what they want, which is usually growth, career opportunity, um, like a fun place to work is like, kind of like, you know what I like and, and uh, you don't really have to recruit, right? Like people will come to you and that can spread in your job posts, the way you position your job posts. If you talk about mission and values, you know, you could do an AB test saying, here's the job where you just list the responsibilities versus here's our company, here's our culture, here's the job. You'll get like 10 times more people applying. So it starts there. Uh, but having that is, is really important, I think. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And, you know, I love that you share that advice because people often think of just kind of the nuts and bolts, put what's in the job description. But if you start with the mission, it's, you're saying it's something people can get behind and you'll attract even more people and better people too. Yeah. And then they'll refer people to you. Right. So, you know, we went from six employees to 10 to 30 to 50 in a year. And, uh, you know, probably 20 of them were, were like referrals from other people. Um, I always joke, like we absorbed other agencies because <laughs> people, you know, people would leave and, and come here and hopefully, hopefully knock on wood, we're creating an environment where they don't want to leave you know, go to other agencies, but sometimes that happens. They'll tell their uh, friends and be like, Hey, like, this is awesome. I love working here. And, and they'll attract their colleagues from other places. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I think is most rough for me as a business owner is like not losing a client, but losing an employee. I'm like, Fuck, where did we go wrong? What didn't we do? How can we improve? It's like, that's, that's like harder than losing any, any client for some weird reason for me. Um, but you know, it happens and, and you grow and move on. Dean, um, last question. Thank you so much for your time on this is I always like book recommendations, audio book, physical book, and you always, you always have great recommendations when it comes to that. And, um, so I'd love to hear a few of your favorites. Um, I know you had recommended to me who, not how, um, mm -hmm. and I listened to that with Dan Sullivan, Benjamin Hardy, and actually funny the uh, yesterday, uh, I had uh, Reed Tracy, who's the CEO president of Hay House, who actually is the publisher of that book. I didn't realize it at the time. So we, he, I brought up, what are some of the books? And he's like, oh, we did. Who? Not? I'm like, oh, that's, that was recommended to me. Cool. Um, what are some of your favorite business or leadership books that you like? Uh, Cal Newport has a new one out. Uh, it's like the death of, e I can't remember the title. It's like the death of email, which is, I think is super ironic. <laughs> that we're, we're talking about email marketing is <laughs> this growth engine and viewers, you know, uh, but it's more about uh, productivity in the work, in the workplace and getting away from, from emails and back to like memos in a sense and thinking long and procedurally about things versus rea reacting to things. He, he estimates that like you could save hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year if, if you can, you know, get better at not doing email. Well, I mean, uh, that's, you know, Slack has proven that and some of the other tools with internal communication with teams for sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I, I, I stopped reading a lot of like leadership books and, and have the last few years got really into biographies of, of leaders because I feel like you find little tidbits of information and like little sayings and strategies and the way they implemented things uh, so I, Benjamin Franklin is my favorite biography. Um, he was a, he was a master uh, at business and politics and science. He, he's, I always think of like America as like him, like he's like the, the go-to person, but he's, he's got some really good business stuff in there where he talks about his competing with other publishers and he's got like, there's just some crazy stories. He pretended to work at another publishing house that was competing with him under an anonymous name and 
got so popular on purpose, then ended up switching to his publishing house so that that other company would crash. I was like, oh, holy shit. Like, you're sorry. Uh, but anyways, uh, I just read the uh, Barack Obama biography, um, which, which I thought was really good. I had some good leadership tips in there and strategies. So I, I, I like stories, you know, and sometimes the business books are, are often repetitive, uh, I, I find, whereas the biographies are like, I can't, this, this scenario sounds really interesting. How could it apply to me? Yeah. Yeah. Check out, uh, thank you for that recommendation. Check out biographies, check out worth ecommerce.com and relationship commerce podcast. Uh, Dean, I want to be the first one to thank you. This was fantastic. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.